if you had decided to join the Methodist Church before the year 1916, what you would have been asked is, will you cheerfully be governed by the rules of the Methodist Episcopal Church, hold sacred the ordinances of God, and endeavor as much as in you lies to promote the welfare of your brethren in the advancement of the Redeemer's kingdom? Will you contribute of your earthly substances according to your ability to, to the support of the gospel and the various benevolent enterprises of the church? As I read that, I ponder, was that how people spoke? Or did they just want to sound really fancy? I don't know. But, uh, 1916, a group of Methodist bishops took this rather formal language and they made it far simpler. And so, to this day, if you are going to join a Methodist church, you'll be asked, as a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? The witness was, part was added as of January 1st, 2009. These are uh, far more direct and, and simple to understand. Uh, also, there are words that we have either all said at some point, or uh, we have been, if we've been part of worship when someone has joined the church, we've been part of recommitting ourselves to that uh, vow, that oath to, be, this is how we will be part of the church. And so what we're going to be doing for these next couple weeks is looking at how do Methodists follow Jesus in this church. Like how, and, and this is one way to frame that. Prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And so this week we'll start by looking at prayer. Now, when I, uh, as I may have I've said before, when I started following Jesus, I struggled with the idea of prayer. Like, how does this work? Because I don't check my brain at the door. I want to think through, like, understand what, what's happening here. And as I listened to how prayer was practiced, it seemed like there was one approach to prayer that understood God to be some sort of pleasant yet forgetful old person who just needs to be reminded. Oh, oh, that's right. Little Timmy is sick. Thank you for reminding me that little Timmy is sick. I'll get right on that. Right? Thank you for praying and reminding me. Or another version of this is the uh, other extreme, I guess, would be that uh, God is just so busy and like, oh, 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 okay, fine. You keep on pestering me about little Timmy and I'll squeeze him into my schedule. I'll make room for a little Timmy. And both of these seem a little bit lacking. Like the God of Scripture can keep track of the entire world, creates and continues to create all that is, keeps the stars burning, the planet spinning, counts the, can count the hair on a person's head, like everything. This God, our understanding of God, can take care of little Timmy. God is God. God has time for, for all of us. And both of these approaches, the remind God because otherwise the doddering old fool will forget, or the pester God because otherwise he just won't do anything, both of them are versions of trying to get God to do something. Right? This is prayer as a way to accomplish a task. Prayer as a tool. If we, if we pray really hard, then we're going to get what we want. It, it becomes a utilitarian thing, right? And it leads to a set of questions like, if I, if I pray for little Timmy and he doesn't get better, was I praying hard enough? If I pray for little Timmy and he's not getting better, am I, am I not praying right? If I pray for little Timmy, does, is, does prayer not work if he doesn't get better? And so we end up asking these questions about prayer if we approach it as a tool and a utilitarian thing. Right? This approach to prayer, it's not going to sustain us. It is just, I just flat don't think it works. Prayer is not a means to an end. Prayer is a means to relationship. Right? Prayer is not a means to an end. Prayer is a means of being in relationship. And it's not about accomplishing tasks. It's about experiencing being with God. 
When we pray, it is time to be with God. It is time to receive what God offers. And so it's not something to, that we have to try at or get right. Prayer is time to talk to family. It's in a sense, Heavenly Father, right? And so... Like we, there's as much sort of like working through it and analyzing it. I mean, as some as there would be if you're going to sit down and have dinner with your family. I mean, when you sit down to have dinner with your family, it's not uh, like you have a bulleted checklist of all the things you need to get through if you're going to have dinner with your family. No, you you sit down and you have dinner, right? That's just how it works. Now, um, in the, this is sort of this relationship with, with, with a parental figure, a heavenly father is the phrase we tend to use to think through this. And the thing about this is like, just like the way that your, your dad or your mom seem all knowing when you're young, I'm just like, all, they know everything. How do they know everything, right? It, when, when a child comes up to tell their parent about something, how often does the parent already know? Like we, we had an accident um, a few days ago, and uh, Sophia was practicing swinging, um, practicing t-ball, and she was, got a good swing on that bat, and, and she managed to hit her brother, Fletcher, in, in the side of the head. And, um, and it's fine. We went and we checked all of the... He, he, has a, he had a big knot. It, it's better now. But, I mean, there's that moment of terror. Did, did, is he broken? No, no, he's fine. He, he just hurts. Right? And so when Fletcher comes to me and is, like, telling me his head hurts, I know. <laughs> like, it's, but I don't look at him and say, well, Fletcher, I already know your head hurts. I mean, but it's time to sit down. He's got something he needs to talk about, Daddy. My head hurts. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to sit down and listen because that is what matters, right? I'm going to be there to listen to my son when he tells me about what, what matters. Like, and, and that's how, that's the comparison here. To, we pray to our, our Heavenly Father and we approach a, as a child, and knowing that uh, God already knows it's not about data conveyance. It's about relationship. Right? I remember like uh, the way that just talking through things matters. Like uh, I remember growing up, there's this, what would happen if, if I sat down and I, I wanted to talk through something with, with my mom or my dad, if I started talking through something, if I got halfway through it and realized, wow, that really doesn't make a lot of sense. Like it just, well, that's what happens. You start talking through things with, with people. Um, I, I think the same thing, we see the same thing happening with prayer. Like King David in scripture, we, we read about it, it's in 2 Samuel 24.10. There's this whole story that's unfolding with, with David, who, who's the king, and he has made a very poor decision, and we could get into the, the challenge of the census that he takes. But um, the, the key moment here is this one verse where he is confessing to his, his Heavenly Father that he is whiffed. And, and the humility that we see there is key. Like David has every reason to approach God with, with a sense of his own importance, because he's a king, and he's a leader of armies, and, and, and he, he's in charge of the nation. But it is, and it, what has happened is, is he has forgotten to be humble, and he has just made a, a very poor decision. And, and what gets him out of the mess, and what gets him through the mess, is, is the humility to turn back and, and go to God humbly. And, um, and we struggle with that, right? We struggle with that to to approach God humbly because we are trained by our culture, formed by our culture to, to believe that we are in charge of our lives. We are the ones who are the, the captains of our lives and we're in charge and we know what we're doing. And um, this is a tendency that I have. I like to believe that I'm in control. Yes, I, I know what I'm doing. Here I am. I, I know what I'm doing. I fake that well, at least. Um, and I think this is part of why it is so important to remember that the, the one prayer that we have that we know is perfect, the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer, like this is it. If you want to focus on one place to learn and be formed by the practices uh, and as a sort of model of prayer, this is it. And the way that the Lord's Prayer starts with is with our Father. Like the way to start praying is to acknowledge that I'm not the dad. Like, I'm not the parent. I'm not the one in charge here. I come to uh, prayer as 
uh, our, it starts with our Father. Right? And so I'd like to imagine uh, prayer as like sitting down and having coffee with someone, but um, that, that's something, that's an activity sort of between equals. We're gonna have coffee, we're gonna talk through something. Uh, th this is far less coffee with equal and more, far more lap time with daddy. And, and um, I struggle with that, but that's what it is, right? So the Lord's Prayer starts with our Father. And from there, the first thing we ask for, right? The very first thing, we start by acknowledging our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Like the prayer starts not by focusing on little Timmy or focusing on what anything about me. It starts by focusing about God. Thy kingdom come. What do you want, God? I mean, one way to translate uh, kingdom is politics, right? Your politics, your polity, your way of doing things. May it come. It's a, so we start out with prayer by focusing on God's dreams, God's desires. And, and then we move on to the give us this day our daily bread, which is not our weekly ration or our monthly whatever we want or our yearly dreams, our 10-year plans. It is our daily bread. Part of uh, praying for the daily bread is, is a remembrance of the relationship of um in a healthy family, when things are going well, I, you don't worry as a child whether you will have dinner the next night. You, you enjoy your daily bread, your daily meal with your family, and you have trust that tomorrow will take care of itself. Uh, so give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In the very center of this prayer is the center moment of, of that sal of was salvific, right? Forgiveness. Jesus teaches us that, that we are forgiven and, and our ability to accept forgiveness is connected to our ability to let that cup overflow and, and so that that forgiveness is passed along. For, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. May we, part is part of your kingdom, right? If, if God's politics, God's kingdom is going to be going to come, that's living a life of, of forgiveness, accepting it and, and, and passing it, letting it overflow and, and pass along. We, we come to, to God on God's terms. Like, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I, I appreciate the honesty there. It does not say avoid all evil or let's skip all evil or I hope I never have to deal with any evil, but deliver us. And you only need to be delivered from something that you're in the middle of. Right? This is not the prayer that the cosmic sugar daddy will make it all right all the time. This is the prayer of someone who's going to walk through life and know that sometimes life, there's going to be evil. There's going to be temptation. And we, this is a prayer to deliver us from it so that then we wrap up with the end of the Lord's Prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. And we end with the very same place we began. Thy kingdom. Your, your kingdom. Uh, for thine is the kingdom. Like this focus on for the beginning and the ending on what is it that, that God wants? Uh, what is it that, that matters to, to, to him, to, to God? When we pray, when we approach God as our Heavenly Father, we are free to do this in whatever way works, right? There are, is there a right way for a family to get together and spend time together? Well, no, there's just what each family does. Right? And they're, they're, So you work out what's, what's going to work out. Like they're, they're, I spent a period of time... A, saying the rosary with a friend of mine in seminary, uh, Jason, every, every Wednesday. I, we we got to, to the Duke Chapel, uh, the crypt there, and uh, we'd say the uh, rosary in the daily office. And so that was what I did for a while. I don't do it now, but I mean, so families change, people people change. But re rosary, like what, what I do now is I write, like I get up in the morning, I write, and, and the act of holding the pen and having the paper keeps me focused and from falling back asleep. And other people do meditation, of, as a way of prayer, some people just read uh, slowly, read scripture slowly, do whatever works. Remembering, like what what Jesus says at the beginning of the, as he's about to teach the Lord's prayer, is do not pile up words like some of the Gentiles do, like those people do. Say what you're going to say. The Lord's prayer is short, right? Say what you're going to say. Take some time with it. But this is not something to be hour after hour, like three, four, five minutes in the morning. 
that's good. Like, if that's where you're at, great. You spend more time, great. That, that, that Lord's Prayer, to write the Lord's Prayer, like, um, what I do every morning, I write. And the first thing I write is the prayer that this church has, has committed to praying uh, that we use at the end of worship every time. Uh, the Lord, enter in our lives and fill us with overflowing grace that we might learn where you call us to go and who to serve. And open doors that lead us in the new seasons of faithfulness and fruitfulness. Give us courage to step through those doors and towards your kingdom. And that, that's right here on the pulpit. That's what we use every single Sunday for how we, we worship. I pray that for for this church every single morning for, for us. And it's not a, a lot of time, but that, that's how I pray. So this relate this prayer is it, about relation. It's not about accomplishing tasks. And, and what happens over time is that re our relationships uh, change us. Right? Our relationships change us. I I am struck by uh, the way that relationships change because we see how that happens. As one example, when you get married and you hang out with the same person for year after year after year, things change. Who, if you think about how, what I see in it is a sense of humor. Whose sense of humor changes based upon who you get married to? Like I can definitely tell that the Fletcher sense of humor has rubbed off on other parts of, of the family. And uh, it, it, yeah. <laughs> Prayer does the same thing. We're, we're in relationship with God and the Spirit is moving and it's changing us. We're praying for God's kingdom and, and what God cares about is, is becoming what we care about thy kingdom come right if we as we live this life of prayer what we're believing what we're experiencing is that uh, what god desires what god hopes for what god dreams it will become what we focus on what we dream what we hope for and i believe it is properly put at the beginning of this list prayers presence gifts witness service like prayer comes first it is the root of everything that we do because if we're not starting with prayer then, then we are very easily uh let us stray. Prayer is what keeps us focused uh, relationally on God. It's not about accomplishing a set of tasks. It's about, uh, you know, we, we pray for little Timmy, like God cares about little Timmy. We care about little Timmy. We all care that, that people are healed, but we're, what we're doing is we're praying, uh, talking with God and saying, we hope your will is done. We, we offer ourselves to be part of that will. We want to be in a relationship part of the family that is doing your will. And, and here we go. Amen. Okay.